Welcome to Two Crows Frightening Frauen. It's Tyler and Lee. Whee! <laughs> <laughs> and I have two that I have written up. I still haven't decided which one I want to do yet today, but... You a coin? I have a coin. We'll just do whichever one comes up first. Okay. This one's exciting. So I will have save that for after our banter. <laughs> <laughs> So you got your car detailed today. Yeah, just the interior, uh, because that's what I could afford. And that's really what it was. The interior doesn't really get that dirty. But after the road trip, it had like all that desert dust. So um, I got that all cleaned out. Plus something spilled on my seat during the road trip. Um, Side effect having a cooler in the passenger seat. Oh, yeah. So... He he went in and got it all clean and got that and then and then conditioned the leather seats and stuff. So I was like, yeah. you put the lotion on its skin. <laughs> uh, leather seats are nice. The Mercedes has leather seats, but the Mercedes is also black, and it's been like over a hundred degrees. <laughs> yeah, my car's all black, and I have I have tinted windows, and I always put the thing up, but it's it's rough like you don't want any bare skin on on the seat but i have seat warmers and um with the leather it's really nice because it kind of like radiates out i know isn't it nice that when we get older we use the seat warmers just for our back pain <laughs> it's like not for anything else yep it's to- it's totally for like my glute because my glute spasms and it helps with that a lot mm-hmm Oh, I feel that because I have like sciatic nerve damage. So it goes like down my gluteus. Yep. That's maximus. basically, I get, I get the injection in my piriformis because the piriformis starts to spasm. It causes that sciatica to go and it Shoot. also causes the nerves, the, um, what are they called? The pudendal nerves or whatever, the ones that go into the bladder and all that area. So it's just like that whole area will just get pissed. But the sciatic causes like my, my, um, I get like, uh, electrical zapping in my foot and my toes will do this involuntarily. Oh. It's, it's crazy. I'm like, okay, body. Um, I have a, an oopsie. Oh yeah. Yeah. So for you on audio, you will have all of that for you on video. You will <laughs> oh, not you didn't start it. That's right. <laughs> I know there was something missing. <laughs> okay, so we'll start for video. So you guys are going to get my intro twice for you wonderful audio listeners. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Oh, here we go. There we go. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on Frightening Frauen. It's Tyler and Lee. Woo! And you get a little less of our banter because we were bad. <laughs> so go listen to the first five minutes of the audio and you'll have everything you need to know. <laughs> that record button was being super sneaky and like hiding from you. I know. I was like, I never heard the record sound. And yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry, YouTube. <laughs> and if you on audio didn't know, we do record because I don't think I ever announced that we had visual. Maybe I did once. But we do have video up for this segment on YouTube. So go on over there. Same name for the podcast. And they're all up, but the only ones with video right now are the Frightening Frauen ones. Yep. Maybe someday I'll figure out how to record in one... How is it? One foul swoop? One... Yeah, I never know what the words are for that. It's too much work to edit them all together. Yeah, and when it's conversational, it's a little easier to have just one fluid conversation that we can just yeah. post for you. Although, like, I mean, my RV ones, they're, like, a chunked up and it's fine. I just literally just put them all in there, make sure they're in order, and if there's any weird, like, be- stuff at the beginning. Like, if it takes me too long to get in front of the camera, I'll cut that or whatever. But, so, maybe That's you true. just do that. I'll play with that idea. Maybe I'll have some that are just video that I do because that might be easier because the ones that I do a lot of research for, for like my cryptids, it's a lot of reading my scripts and I'd be really annoying if I'm just here like, and then, and then I mess (laughs) up and I have to like start again and it's like clips out. 
the cryptid went up to the lady. <laughs> <sighs> so we'll we'll see. Maybe I'll do some separate fun just video ones where I'm just talking at you from my brain. Cause my dyslexia is not fun for one take. Because <laughs> with you, I can pause when, like, I feel my brain jumbling things up, and then we can chat about what I just read. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. I can see that. I don't, because I don't, I don't read stuff. Like, I did do like one where I was reading one thing, and it went okay, but like I made a few mistakes. But I just kind of was like, eh. you know, it's like when I told the joke in that one episode, I just committed all <laughs> all my rambling in between each piece of the joke. <laughs> But that made it better. <laughs> <laughs> I like your RV videos. Yeah. You guys should go over to... Is your YouTube on Lee Linos do- or Lee doing stuff? Lee doing stuff, but there's a... Um, pod- my podcast is on Linos and it's like its own playlist, but it's it's marked as a podcast on... So if you search for on Linos, it, com- it comes up as a podcast on YouTube. Okay, and that'll take you to your profile. Yeah. So if you go to that profile, Lee has some awesome newbie, noob RV videos that are really interesting to watch about all the challenges that Lee should not be going through. (laughs) I have the worst luck. (laughs) It's been so bad. I mean, I've had bad luck with mine, but I had time to, like, I had a house to live in at the same time while working on it, and then... When I was working on it on the road, there were some challenges where my power went out and I couldn't figure out why. And it was negative 20 degrees. Shit. <laughs> and I could not figure out why I couldn't get the bus to start. I couldn't get my, my Jeep to start. Everything was broken. I feel like I broke everything. And it was just a fuse to my solar system that I had to replace. It was a $2 fix. Yeah. I have a box of fuses. Like, I literally, it's one of the things I put on my wish list because, like, I read that, like, fuses on on uh, vehicles of that type, they are prone to going. So, and I actually think I might have a blown fuse based on when I was trying to use the power in the RV. Some of it worked. And then, like, these, like, three things didn't work. And I was like, I bet they're all on the same thing. And, like, just, there's probably a bad fuse. So I just haven't chased it down yet. But... Yeah, the, it's super um, smart. It's smart to have that as a backup, even in a vehicle. Yeah, the, the RV videos help me. Like, they give me something to look forward to when I'm doing the work because I'm um, basically suffering through this situation of betrayal, and I have so much like anger and stuff. And then like I keep finding like these little things to do to make it fun for me and it doesn't fix the problem but it helps me like get through it and it's it actually makes me really happy that other people are enjoying it because you know that means my outlet is do something positive by entertaining other people so definitely the only thing that can make it better is if you got in your clown makeup for it (laughs) (laughs) can you imagine like doing the caulking and like I just the clown makeup was just so dripping. It would be so- <laughs> and then I'm just like, ha! Huh? Like, <laughs> do you use uh, water based or oil based? Um, I have both, but what I have on me right now is water based. I use oil based on me and water based on other people because usually I want mine to stay all day while I'm doing cosplay stuff, and the water based just I sweat it all off. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. When I got the water base, I, I thought, like, I wasn't anticipating. But I think, like, it'll be good for the winter. And it it does... Mm-hmm. It's easier to work with for, like, details. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but I use... I do use, like... Um, I usually what I do is, like, the, the oil-based white. And then I just... All my colors and everything are eyeliner and um, eyeshadow. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, so everything else I just... And the eyeliner pens have held up really great. And they were like... Mm -hmm. I think I paid like eight bucks for five of them. And... um, Nice. And then I just used like a nice... An eyeshadow with a really nice pigment. And... Mm -hmm. So for all you clowns out there, there's some some hacks for you. (laughs) I used eyeshadow and just um, 
uh, a foundation that's the wrong color for me <laughs> for my old Greg. So I just mixed green in with that for my old Greg stuff because I couldn't find my body paint. <laughs> Uh, you it wouldn't even you wouldn't even know. That's cool. Yeah, I used uh, it was actually my daughter's eyeshadow, so it was really cheap, but it was really pigmented, <laughs> and I don't think she'll notice that I just like <laughs> took half her green. <laughs> yeah, I have green green body paint floating around somewhere from I was for Halloween one year I was Miss Martian, and um, and but I the, love that. But we did it too too dark so mm-hmm. like I was like too green but um it was still fun my friend like made the suit and we just went out to this rave and she was awesome raving. I've always wanted to go to a rave I don't do drugs or anything but I want to go because you really get into like the music like you don't even need drugs to like feel all yeah. the stuff going on around you I just feed off the energy of everybody else because I don't do drugs either and you know like when I was younger and I would go to raves, I would go and I would just take pictures and I would like absorb the music. I didn't dance. But the last couple ones I went to, I ended up dancing and like straining the tendons on my legs, uh, like around my ankles for like two no. weeks after. But it was like so worth it just to get out and have fun, you know? Okay, well, when I come out to visit you, we should bring our walkers and go to the rave. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, like make sure to wear like decorate uh, them kinesio tape and and compression socks and you know some you can cover it and... fur boots <laughs> do like fur with LEDs around it and stuff that'd be awesome we could do this yeah it would be the ball and grannies we'll let you all know and you can help support our fund for decorating our walkers. <laughs> Like jumping a lot easier because you just like hold the walker and jump around. Because like all the races I've been to the last couple of years, they're like they don't play like these like long like oomph, oomph songs. They play like these songs that have a crescendo where it like mm. builds up, and so like the oh like you can dance a little bit, and then it's kind of like it just feels like you're supposed to jump, and that's what happens. You feel the whole floor flexing because everybody's like boing boing as it builds up. <laughs> And then it goes into the next part of the song, and you get about two minutes, and then it builds up, and then, then everyone goes boing, boing, boing. It's uh, honestly lazy DJing. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. but it is. But um, energy's fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I can understand that, and I think DJing in general, like it's a very it's an art. I DJed for a while for uh, events, mainly weddings, mainly gay weddings. And <laughs> Those are the only people who'd hire me because I was female presenting. <laughs> but uh, they, yeah, it's it's different now than it was back then for DJing. And I really respect the people that I've seen on TikTok lately that are going back to old school DJing and actually mixing things. Have you seen DJ, they, DJ Sasha on there? Uh, it's pro- like, a, he's a really old guy. Like, he looks like he's like, late 60s 70s i think i have he's famous he's from the height of it and was like i loved him back then he's amazing so whenever i see him doing his lives on tiktok i'm like that's so cool i want to be like that (laughs) i know i was not that good but i did do my own mixing so i didn't have any so i had to be right there (laughs) um i couldn't leave to go get cake or anything unless i had an assistant with me (laughs) Yeah, but it was fun and I miss DJing but I don't know if I have the mental capacity for it anymore <laughs> I got somebody sent me equipment so that I could start learning to mix because it's something I, I like the music that I've always been into um, I've always wanted to do the mixing and I used to like mm-hmm. go talk to the DJs and like suggest music to them and then I had friends that got into DJing and instead of me getting into it because I like closed doors for myself all the time and I was also very poor so I would hang out with people doing the stuff that I wanted to do and then tell them how to do it and make their sets better and stuff you know so and then I would go out and watch them like spin and they would people would like love the sets and I'd be like that's right if I was DJing (laughs) so um but I I tried to play with the equipment and I did okay but the mental the mental focus part 
I just was not there. And I'm hoping like I will be at some point, but like I've just been so into making art and stuff. Yeah. But, like Yeah. Which it is art. Yep. So I think it would be fun for you to because I feel like you're more in your element when you have your makeup on for you to DJ live with your clown makeup on and it would bring in a lot of people. <laughs> Probably. I have like so much learning to do before I could do it like live though because like it's all like yeah. And then the music I listen to isn't um, isn't what most people enjoy. So I like I, your music. It, it brings in like very specific people. You know, well, it's not yeah. the stuff in my videos on TikTok. Almost none of those are songs that I would willingly listen to. <laughs> I choose music that I think other people will enjoy for TikTok videos because the few yeah. that I've done that were music that made me happy did not do well. Well, the ones you the ones you sent me. So the songs you sent me to listen to are the ones I'm talking about. And then I went and talked to my dad about them, and he's like, "I love all those songs." <laughs> oh. I don't even remember what I sent you. But it was uh, I always uh, curate men, for people. Oh, the men without hats. Men like without hats. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. My my happy music is like German industrial and stuff like that. So I think people would like that. I mean, because, some people do, but yeah. yeah. I think so, because a lot of the people watching those lives, the DJers even in the U.S., are people in Europe. Yeah. So I really think that they would like it. I know that uh, he'll be listening to this, but John uh, Aquintex on TikTok, he's a DJ, and he's on my patron, Patr- Patreon. <laughs> Uh, he's almost always on there DJing and he loves it. Like he started out as just a newbie and he even posted on there. Like I'm learning, like don't be mad at me for doing things wrong or mixing things <laughs> wrong and songs not matching up. Right. And he learned by being on live and having other DJs come to him and help him. And he now does it almost full time <laughs> on, oh. on TikTok. That would be fun. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's... it's uh, There's, like, a whole world of... Like, when I got into, like, electronic music, because it wasn't just industrial, it was, like, I was into, like, all the, the electronic stuff, like, the, but not so much the American scene, because it was really basic. Like, American tech does... Bing, 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 You know? I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> it's so... There's no layers. There's no, like... It's fun to dance to, but, like, I love, like, music that just demands, you know, like, I don't know if it's an ADHD thing or whatever, but, you know, like, when, like, the whole, like, um, the the thing started coming out with, like, music on TikTok that's, like, has it uses panning, and everyone was freaking out about it, and, like, oh, wow, that's so amazing, and I was, like, yeah, that's, that's, that's how music should be. Yeah, <laughs> I was, like literally like listening to like stuff like front 242 and even in the late 70s they would like layer their tracks because there weren't mm-hmm. enough of tracks to work with to get the panning effect and like you know it just you should have to have both your headphones in to experience <laughs> the music <laughs> yeah so i and i just yeah i love when it's demanding and there's like and so every time i listen to it i can focus on something different mm-hmm. and yeah that's why so i love going to death metal festivals and i find that the nicest people are at death metal festivals as well teddy bears teddy bears oh. everywhere and it's just i'll sit there and this the one place i feel safe doing this is closing my eyes there and just like feeling the music because you can feel each individual aspect of the music in different parts of your body and it is the most satisfying feeling sensory wise for me is to sit at a death metal festival with my eyes closed. <laughs> That's cool. I um I saw Mozart's Requiem performed live by the San Francisco Symphony and <sighs> I'm literally getting goosebumps now just like remembering it. it is like so incredible and like being in the room with it, being in the room with like the acoustics that were set up for that and the timpani and like just Oh my god, like, you know, literally like I had to close my eyes because I would just start crying. It was so like amazing and like overwhelming. And um most concerts I go to the sound quality isn't good enough to no matter how interesting it is live, I end up preferring the pre-recorded stuff because it's so much cleaner. There are a few exceptions like 
Uh, Frenchie for two has a couple like live albums that the quality of the recordings are like phenomenal. Um, but on average, like I don't, I agree. Yeah. I completely agree with that. Um, for recordings for actually being there it sounds so different yeah. but listening to it especially when people send it to you because they were there it's terrible yeah <laughs> yeah like, i not, saw i don't want to <laughs> i saw metallica live at the arco stadium in sacramento and the acoustics were so poor where i was sitting i couldn't tell what song was playing it was very I, muddy i could see that happening with their music too yeah and it was it was definitely like where i was sitting it was when I went to Pink, I saw Pink Floyd twice and I had broken my leg. <laughs> and so we ended up in the in the handicap section and um, it was a cement box. And again, the acoustics were like, like you could, half the time you couldn't tell what song was playing. And I was, I was 12 years old and I was so offended that disabled people would be given like the shittiest acoustics you know, I was just like, that was like the kind of the beginning of me becoming like aware of this, this bullshit that's out there, you know, but that's terrible. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think about that because they're usually off to the sides so that they have easy access to leaving. But with the way that most places are set up, you can leave from anywhere. So <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me of why they're always off to the side where the acoustics are not going to be as good. Yeah, I did have a good experience seeing Puddle, Puddle's Pity Party. Uh, like they had a really nice like it was a small venue, but the section was like nice and you're like up close and and uh, I didn't feel like because I was in the disabled section that I was missing out on anything. And, you know, that was cool. But I don't know how it would be like I don't know how the big venues are now. Um, mm-hmm. cause I, you know, I haven't been to any in a while. I really want to go to Red Rocks because I hear the acoustics there, no matter where you're, you sit, is amazing. And it's just a natural, like, amphitheater out of the Red Rocks. And uh, it sounds amazing to me. I would love yeah. to go. I, I hiked there a lot, but I never saw a band there. There's a location in Saratoga, which is here in the on the peninsula that apparently is like that. And... But the shows are, it's, they're small, but you get big bands, but they're very expensive as a result. But I've heard that the acoustics are very nice there. Oh, I want to go to all of them. <laughs> Just absorb the sound, the frequencies. They do a really good job in London with the places that they have. Uh, so there's like a strip in London that they have all of their like live shows going on. So I went and saw Wicked there and the acoustics I talked to them about it and all of the different venues were made by some uh, the same people or a similar like group of people just so that no matter where you sit it sounds amazing and yeah so they have their shows always there in those locations so like Wicked is always where it is I mean we, we have so much like technology for sound now there's really no excuse for bad acoustics like get better dudes right yeah um speaking of acoustics no i'm just kidding has nothing to do with (laughs) a segue into our story today (laughs) but her name is elizabeth styles and not related to harry so (laughs) which has to do with music she does not though (laughs) so She was born August 21st, 1816 in East Ashtabula, Ohio. Do not kill me for not pronouncing that correctly. Ashtabula. Ashtabula. I'm like, I have to look it up. The funny thing is my recording earlier today was about Ohio. I spelled it right. I spelled it right. Good. I said it phonetically. (laughs) <laughs> that was one of those bridges like those covered bridges mm. um, but while you look that up it may, that makes her a Leo which I put in there because it would bug you <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't really bug me I just sort of 
let it I like let it slither past without really holding on to it. <laughs> I mean, my son is a cancer, and I spent my entire pregnancy running around going, it's not a tuba. So, <laughs> okay, that's funny, though. <laughs> Gotta love some Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. My dad used to say that when anything was in his pocket. <laughs> it's not a tuba. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, guys. Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, so I was not going to talk about... This is another one that came up randomly while I was researching the other one I was going to talk about today. I was listening to a podcast about haunted places, and they lightly breezed past this person, Elizabeth Stiles, and for like five seconds. And I'm like, I need to know more about her, because she sounds <laughs> fascinating. Uh, and she, she is fascinating. <laughs> Okay, so she was born to her mother, Clarissa, and father, John Fox Brown, and had an older brother who's... Im they only mention the important siblings in here a little bit, so I added them in later from somewhere else. But So she had an older brother, John Jones Brown. That's a name. Uh, they were new settlers in East Ashtabula in the east bank of the river. So there was like an east and a west side that two different families got land for and like a lot of land because they were just giving it out back then as if it was a thing that was going to run out of style, which we ran out of land, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it started out as like two families on either side of the river and then it became like this big bustling city. Um. Yeah, I even wrote in here, I love that back then you could just squat on some land and say it's yours. <laughs> Try doing that in a small town. Right? So I wanted to add that, that joke in. Okay. So <laughs> Elizabeth's mother and father hailed from Middleton, Connecticut, and her brother was also born in Middleton. She was the first child born in Ashtabula, uh, which I'm probably still Ashtabula. saying wrong. <laughs> Um, so her brother was born in 1813 and Elizabeth was born in 1816. So they moved in between those two dates to Ashtabula. And then her younger sister, that's also important and not the only other sister, but one they want to mention, and it took some digging to find the others, was born in 1828. So there's a 12 year difference between Elizabeth and Emmeline. And they were the closest of the siblings together. Uh, <clears throat> and where was I at there? So they were very close. Uh, and because of this, Elizabeth thought of herself as another mother for Emmeline as she grew up because of the age difference and society at the time. <laughs> In total, her parents had nine children during wow. their 17 years of marriage. In 17 years, they had nine children. <laughs> it's like almost... Wow, that's a, that's a lot of work. Yeah. So they had, yeah, Justin, John, um, they were born in Middleton, and then Samuel, Elizabeth, William, Clarissa, Emmeline, and George were born in Ohio. I need, I gotta, hold on. That was close. Ashtabula. Ashtabula. Ash Bula. Ashtabula. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I don't think there's any way to make that sexy. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth's mother, Clarissa, died on Valentine's Day, 1829, when she was 36 years old. It does not say how she died. Uh, but 36 years old sounds scary and 17 years with nine children is probably the reason <laughs> yeah Th not wow started young okay yeah yeah, yeah they all started pretty young because Emmeline starts pretty young too <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Elizabeth's father introduced Elizabeth to guns when she was five. <laughs> guns? <laughs> mm -hmm. This is a hint. This is a hint, right? No, not really. But I mean, kind of. I mean, she she stays really good with guns <laughs> her whole life. 
<laughs> but she was a really good shot, like amazing shot. And her dad would always take her hunting because of it. And then I put in here that Evelyn started shooting at five too, and she's a great shot. So maybe she'll end up like Elizabeth. <laughs> um, he made a point to teach her how to maintain the guns well. Uh, she became an expert shot, and they shared many hunting trips together. And her obituary in the Goshen Daily Democrat described her childhood this way. She was the master spirit of the home and neighborhood. At the age of five years, she could handle a gun and ride on horseback, in which accomplishments she became proficient. I wonder if it was at the same time. That would be fun. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in her teens, she had a far-reaching and in- inviolable reputation as an expert cheesemaker and skillful nurse. <laughs> That's what her obituary said. Very rounded. Great with guns. And also nothing, great with cheese. <laughs> nothing else in her story talks about cheese. <laughs> no idea where that came from. <laughs> but apparently she shared it with neighbors or something. Um, Elizabeth's mother, a talented nurse, took Elizabeth with her on patient calls, attending births, helping the sick, and aiding families dealing with deaths. Elizabeth received her formal schooling in nursing in (laughs) Ashtabuela schools and may even have taught a few terms herself before she left that town uh, when she was 21 years old. Uh, they, I did find records later after I'd written that she did teach classes there in uh, nursing, which at 21, already be, having gone to school for nursing, finished school and was teaching classes. Yeah. I don't know how long nursing school was then, but, and she probably already had some credits or whatever they'd call it back then for working with a nurse, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Uh, when Elizabeth left... Why did I write the name of this town so many times? <laughs> <laughs> you probably thought that you, you were like, oh, Lee's going to like this one. I know, Ash- probably. Ashtabula. <laughs> Ashtabula. <laughs> Bound for Chicago. That's easier to say. Uh, she had already witnessed her town grow from her single family settlement to a pretty widespread town with a trade route of steamboats making their way down the river, separating east and west. Ashtabuela. <laughs> Beulah. Um, sail vessels were um, traversing the lakes and rail. Oh, railroads were proposed at this time, but not made yet. But it was a major trade um, central for people at that time, which is crazy that in the 21 years that it went from like nothing to a bustling city. Right. Uh, The major roads in the village were Main Street, Prospect, Lake and Division Streets and the various roads leading in and out of the village. The north and south squares were laid out, and a cemetery was located behind the existing schoolhouses. Hmm. I want to go to that schoolhouse. Probably haunted as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did find this from a haunted hotel or haunted location podcast. So. <laughs> it, it So a- Ashtabula is the largest city in Ashtabula County, so it remains... A bustling city. Yeah. (laughs) I have to go there and pronounce the name wrong. Yes. The (laughs) Ashtabula Street and North Park and William Hubbard. Wait, it's in North Park. And William Hubbard taught there. I I guess that was important. I put that in there. William Hubbard sounds familiar. (laughs) It does sound familiar. Now everyone's going to be in the comments telling us how stupid we are for not realizing who this is. I'm bad at names. I'm not stupid. I'm just bad at names. I know. Me too. I thought it was important. And usually I'll put why after something, but I did not for that one. (laughs) Okay. I have to look that up. In the middle of the night, I I thought that was cool. (laughs) Lee is looking it up. So this is your intermission. Is it? Well, there's there's several of them. There's a William C. Know. Hubbard. There's a William H. J. Hubbard. Well, it was in eight the eighteen hundreds. William Peyton Hubbard looks promising. 
Uh, the first... Well, and there's also... Well, that's Toronto. That doesn't count. Or does it? I don't know. The, the, Maybe. There's a William P. Hubbard was the first person of African descent on Toronto City Council. Oh, that he might be He was elected in 1894 and served for 15 years. So that might be who it is. That would make sense for why I thought think that's important. Yeah. <laughs> we'll pretend that's who it is. Guys, that's who it is. And it says here he invented the portable oven. <laughs> We might need to do, to look more into him, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or his or his wife. <laughs> yeah. Um, in 1837, when Elizabeth Brown was 21 years old, she moved to Chicago, supporting herself with her skills as a seamstress, teacher, and nurse. She did all three of those jobs at the same time to support herself and her family back home. She was sending money back to them too because she felt bad leaving them. With so many children and no mother. You keep picking these people that have more energy than we ever had combined. (laughs) It makes me feel bad. I can't even get out of bed. (laughs) Oh, by the way, I have Lee with me. (laughs) My support Lee. Uh, uh, So... Where is it? She boasted about how important her family was to her and would send money back to them from her jobs to help support the younger ones and show appreciation for the skills she learned through her parents. She was very close to her sister, Emmeline, and maintained a close relationship with her and her sister's kids through her life. One of those kids is very important for the future. (laughs) The fact Elizabeth could support herself and her family at that time was huge. Many women were not allowed to work. Like, they had to have permission from their father or spouse to work. And their money technically belonged to that man. And if they were a single mother, it technically belonged to their son if they had one. It's gross. It is gross. Yeah. Times have changed, but we still need them to change a little more. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. But it's crazy that she had to work three jobs to be able to do all of that. And from the sounds of it, she was full-time with two of those jobs. And then part-time seamstressing. So she was basically just working. Uh, after the nine, after nine years of this, of working a lot, she married Jacob Stiles. Which, again, mm. I, ha- I found no relation to Harry. <laughs> In 1846, um, he... Wait, hold on. That's when they got married, sorry. He was born in 1820. So he was a little older. Was he? I don't know. He was born in 1820. No, so she was older. Yeah. She was nine years... So she was 29, so she's three years older than him. Or was she 30? I don't know. She's the older woman, and I like that. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So uh, he was born in New York. Fancy. Some sources stated that Jacob came from the prominent Stiles family in Ashtabula. <laughs> Ashtabula. I'll never say it right. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Which in turn traced its origins back to the Stiles family of Connecticut. Wonder if they're actually related. You know, they're like cousins or something. Yeah, right. Because it says that she actually knew him from childhood. And then they met up again in Chicago. Ah. Maybe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, little second cousin. <laughs> All right. The 1850 United States Census revealed that Jacob and Elizabeth were living in Peoria with a four-year-old girl named Sarah Stiles. Uh, so the only way we can really trace like their lineage and stuff because they didn't, they weren't like famous people back then, <laughs> was through like census reports. So there's a few of them throughout here. She doesn't co- become famous till later. <laughs> ah. uh, but I'm surprised there's so much about her. So they must have had some reporting or something at, later on in her life. Um, so some reports say that they adopted Sarah, while others say that she's their biological child. So we don't really know, but she did go on to adopt other children later. Uh, records are so fun from that time. 
Uh, There are some sources that claim Elizabeth adopted many children throughout her life. In 1861, Elizabeth and Jacob did adopt her niece and nephew, Clara Elizabeth and George Osmond Dolph, uh, fulfilling a promise she had made to her sister Emmeline on her deathbed in 1858. So her little sister died. And we're not sure why. Yeah. I I tried to find... (laughs) It's probably just one of the, like, common death things that happened at that time. Because, yeah, no antibiotics and, you know, cooties Dysen- abound. Yeah. Dysentery and consumption. <laughs> <laughs> the no, wild no, organ trail. like trail. pooping yourself to death, you know? Oh, goodness. <laughs> um... So in 1859, so this kind of jumps around a little bit. So bear with me because there's several moves that different people make to create this whole story. And they kind of happen simultaneously. So I have to like jump back to the other family here for a little bit. But in 1859, Elizabeth and Jacob moved to Shawneetown in Kansas. I love that they called it Shawneetown. Instead of just like, because the Shawnee tribe is from there. It's like, yeah. Let's just be white men and come in and call it Shawnee Town. <laughs> Possibly for Elizabeth to teach at the Indian Mission or to homestead. It ended up being both. I did research it more after this, and she did teach there. And there's a lot, a lot of records that show that. And they also wanted to homestead there specifically because of political things that were going on that they wanted to get involved with. But she did teach a school for the native, the Shawnee kids, um, because she believed that they deserved the same schooling that the white kids were getting. So she wanted to bring in her teaching ability and help those children because they were being pretty much left out of schooling. Yeah. Shocker. Gee. Wow. Um, People from the Western Reserve usually moved to Kansas for economic opportunities, a better climate, or because they were passionately involved in the slavery or anti-slavery politics of the time, which is why they moved there. Um, Oh, that's what I said after that. (laughs) I have the same note in my head. Um, uh, Settlers came from Ashtabuela County, um, where um, especially passionate people were uh, caring about the um, abolitionism movement. Um, Being from the north, they had a lot of ties with the anti-slavery movements as well as political leaders that were trying to fight against that. So Elizabeth's brother, John Brown, and his son arrived in Kansas before Jacob and Elizabeth arrived in Shawnee. And it's not clear if they moved there because John moved there or if they moved for other reasons because there weren't like... A lot of settlements in between that was kind of the main hub and then there was another main hub in Missouri and then Ohio so in Chicago so there wasn't a lot of separate places to live but it's unclear but it wouldn't surprise me if she moved there specifically because her her brother moved there Uh, determined to prevent Kansas from becoming a slave state and liberate as many slaves as they could This family is awesome. Uh, John Brown Jr. and his wife, her name was Wealthy. Wow. (laughs) Wealthy Hotchkiss. That's some optimistic parents there. They were. Yeah. (laughs) Um, They shared close ties to Ohio with Elizabeth Stiles and her family. Um, she was born in July 25th, 1821 in Hudson Summit County, Ohio. And um, John Brown Jr. enrolled in the Grand River Institute in Austinburg, Ohio in the summer of 1847. He married wealthy Hotchkiss, who was born... Oh, no, sorry. She was born in Ohio in 1829. So the other one was born in Ohio as well. Um, In 1855, Wealthy and John Brown Jr. moved to Franklin County, Kansas, and later that year, several other family members moved to Kansas during Wealthy's time 
time there. Her father-in-law um, and her brothers, brother-in-law became involved in fights with pro-slavery citizens in Lawrence. So I won't get into all of this that I wrote down because it's kind of boring to read out, but they, there was a lot of fighting going on between Kansas, the South, and Missouri um, over slavery. Missouri had counties that really wanted slavery, but the state had outlawed it. So they were kind of still trying to get around it by using Kansas. Because mm-hmm. Kansas was kind of a neutral state at the time, so you could have it or you couldn't have it, and it was up to you. Um, and they were trying to make laws about slavery being outlawed in Kansas at the time. So Missouri was fighting for Kansas to be a slave, pro-slave state, uh, even though the state in general was anti-slave. <laughs> Missouri kind of thought it was the <laughs> South. <laughs> it's not South. <laughs> oh, no, kitty. Amos just attacked my foot. Amos! <laughs> Um, so yeah, they, there was a militia that was organized and they were very upset at their family for being anti-slave and being really prominent in fighting back against it and actually themselves starting some laws and getting things moving to make it an anti-slave state. And so the, they came in and they murdered, uh, both John and Wealthy Uh, for this Um, they both died in their home in 1895 and they were buried on crown hill cemetery in put in bay that's a name too Mm. but yeah so the this did not scare the family though because they were like no this makes us even want to fight you guys even more we're not going to back down because you killed people like that's showing us exactly who you are um, by 1860, the United States federal census listed Jacob and Elizabeth Stiles, both 40 years old. So maybe they're the same. I don't know. It's weird. Their, their birth dates are not the same, guys. <laughs> <laughs> they're not both 40. The census is wrong. Um, as residing in Shawnee, um, Johnson County, Kansas territory, with Sarah Ann Stiles, 10, Clara Elizabeth Dolph, 10, uh, George Osmond Dolph Styles, <laughs> eight, <laughs> um, and J- Jacob had a job as a grocer in the census, so she hmm. was still the breadwinner. Uh, the move to Kansas was a political one for the family, as we stated. Kansas was a hotbed for a fight with the Union, uh, between the Union and the Confederates, and it was nicknamed Bleeding Kansas. Bleeding Ooh. Kansas bleeding (laughs) Um, the confederates had heard of a school teacher integrating the and teaching children um, about equality and abolition and one day while she taught her school kids in Shawnee an incident occurred Elizabeth and a teacher in an adjoining district planned a picnic in the woods to celebrate the 4th of July which I feel like we should all be able to celebrate, right? <laughs> I think there's still a fight today about who's allowed to celebrate that. <laughs> um, so she carried the stars and stripes, um, and the teacher and their sc- sc- scholars, why did I say scholars? School children <laughs> marched around uh, the Liberty Pole in the village green, and then they marched into the woods for a day of fun and picnicking. They had just settled in on their picnic blankets and opened their basket when a man rode up on a horse, handed Elizabeth a note, and trotted away. What did this note say? The The note (laughs) warned her that if she and her pupils marched again at the Liberty Pole Parade with the Union flag, she would be wearing tar and feathers. Oh, shit. This, all right. <laughs> Did this stop Elizabeth? No. This fueled her fire to do more. All right. In 1854, Congress passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, making Kansas a territory and mandating that its citizens would decide whether Kansas would be admitted to the Union as a free or a slave state. The passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act ignited a rivalry with pro-slavery supporters from the bordering states of Missouri. 
which was not a pro-slave state. <laughs> uh, uh, border ruffians and Jayhawker reprisals to the extent that Kansas acquired this, that name, Bleeding Kansas. Uh, J- Jayhawker, what's that? That I didn't look up either, but it was a group of people that were... Um, you can look it up. Look up Jayhawkers. I'm looking it up. <laughs> also, I keep yawning, and it's not... It's because the light... Sometimes if the light hits my eyes just right, it makes me, like, yawn a lot. So I apologize for that. Maybe that's um, my dad's problem. My dad yawns constantly. Jayhawker and Red Leg are terms that came to prominence in Kansas Territory during the bleeding Kansas period of the 1850s. They were adopted by militant bands affiliated with the Free State cause during the American Civil War. So they were the good guys? Um, The name combines two birds, the blue jay, a noisy, quarrelsome thing known to rob other nests, and a sparrow hawk, a quiet, stealthy hunter. No, wait, that's a jayhawk. What are you talking Why did you give me that? Like, it's giving me, like, um, sports stuff now. (laughs) Of course. It's... Sports go sports. I guess it's suggests. Uh, just giving me a lot of different things. It sounded but, like what you said, that they were the ones against the Confederate. Yeah, it says before the start of the Civil War, the name Jayhawkers applied to a band of robbers associated with the Kansas Free Stater cause who wrestled livestock and stole property on both sides of the state line. <laughs> oh, gosh. And dur- during this period, a Jayhawker could be a hero or a villain, depending on individual circumstances or one's opinion on the issue of slavery in Kansas Territory. By the time the war ended, however, the term Jayhawkers became synonymous with Union troops led by abolitionists from Kansas, and Jayhawking became the generic term for armies plundering and looting from civilian populations nationwide. Okay. So they're good bad guys. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right side uh, bad ha- bad habits. Right. Um. So then John, let's see. Elizabeth's nephew received the authority to recruit and transport a company of riflemen in Kansas, and he recruited them primarily from the hunters of western Pennsylvania. Hmm. Okay. Um, On November 12th, 1861, they were mustered into the 7th Kansas Cavalry as Company K with Colonel Mm -hmm. Charles R. Jennison as commander, fighting the bushwhackers in western Missouri along the border of Kansas and the Indian Territory. I hate that that's the word, but love Christopher Columbus. (laughs) Uh, was the seventh first assignment, and as the war wore on, it participated in battles in Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee, and in many skirmishes, that's another word, skirmishes. Until, skirmishes, until the end of the war when it was mustered out at Fort Leavenworth in 1865. Um and so, yeah, they go on to, they were pretty much recruited into the military. So all of the men of the family, um, which is, they wanted to, they wanted to fight and they wanted to do whatever they could do for when the Civil War did break out. Um, so when the Civil War began in April 1861, William Quantrill uh, fought for the Confederacy at the Battle of Wilson Creek and Lexing- Lexington, Missouri. By late 1861, he had collected a band of several hundred men to attack Unionists along the Missouri-Kansas border. On October 17, 1862, William Quantrill and his gang of approximately 140 bushwhackers... <laughs> Sounds like what my grandma would call people on her lawn. (laughs) Y'all bushwhackers. (laughs) Where was I at there? Okay. Stormed into Shawnee and herded the residents into the town square, located next to the present-day city hall. This place is probably haunted as fuck. Mm. Uh, I have to go there, too, I guess. 
<laughs> um, tradition has it that the bushwhackers um, staged the first raid because they were short of clothing and horses, which was very common back then that they'd run out of supplies and have to plunder it from somewhere else. Um, and then they would burn it all up so that there were less supplies. <laughs> but after the bushwhackers had collected what they wanted and had killed two Shawnee residents, they set fire to the town and burned all the buildings in Shawnee, amounting to 20 at the time. William Quantrill and his raiders raided Shawnee, Kansas the second time during the summer of 1863. They needed more supplies, I guess. A raid that was rehe- was a rehearsal for their attack on Lawrence, Kansas, which occurred on August 1863. Jacob Stiles and a Mr. Becker, or Baker, depending on which source you look at, mm-hmm. were the two Shawnee residents that Quantrill and his raiders killed in the first Shawnee raid on October 17th, 1862. Um, so that left Elizabeth a widow. Which sucked back then to be a widow because you were basically a social pariah. <laughs> and she's really unfair. It's not, it's not like it's her fault that he died. No, how dare she have a dead husband? Um, so the raiders approached the two men, uh, Jacob Stiles and Mr. Becker. Oh, I already read that part. Fun. Um, so they went up to Elizabeth. They got her out and she saw her dead husband on the ground which was terrible. And um, she, the gang took Elizabeth. They were about to kill her. And he says, she's too pretty to die. And they leave her alive. Wow. Lovely. Yeah. Like, yay for her, but also, ew. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And it's, there's no account of whether or not they did anything else to her. Um, there were some news articles that alluded that they did and others that said that they they just let her go. And that was a mistake, guys. <laughs> so after, I could probably tell the rest of the story without reading it, because this is the part that excited me. <laughs> um, so I won't have dates for this part, guys, because I'm just going to talk about it. So after that, um, President Lincoln heard about what happened with Elizabeth and how much loss she had in her family, and he summoned her and her children to come up and visit him, I believe, in New York. So she gets up there, and he requests that her and her niece become spies for the Union and go down and try to get information from the Confederates. So she was very happy to do this, and this is where all of her skills come into play. <laughs> she ends up, I believe it's three three years of this that during the war that she does uh, spying. She goes down, and she gets caught by the Confederates as a spy. And what does she do? She convinces them that she's actually a spy for the Confederates against the Union, gives them false information, and is so good at this to the point that they give her a new horse, a better gun, and more clothes, and send her on her way to go and do her spying. <laughs> so, wow. And then she would use uh, the niece, she would call her her granddaughter, and she dressed up like she was older than she was, and she would smoke a a pipe. I have a picture of her, a post that is like the main picture in here. But she would dress up in clothes that made her look older, and make, she would make her face look older so that she looked like the grandmother to the niece. Mm-hmm. And then the niece would get if the niece got caught she'd be like i don't know where my granddaughter is like she's this innocent little girl <laughs> like <laughs> find her or if she got caught the granddaughter would be like my grandma's just crazy like doesn't know what she's doing or talking about <laughs> it was amazing and so she went on with this uh for that i believe it was three years and she got a ton of information for lincoln they actually say that a lot of their like being able to get ahead of the Confederate um, soldiers in places was because of her. And she would use her, so she sometimes would take off her old lady makeup and just be her beautiful self because she was very beautiful, according to people, and just use her womanly wiles to get information. <laughs> That's a nice southern <laughs> belle with her pipe. 
<laughs> but she would ride a horse everywhere. She was amazing with a gun. It doesn't say she had to use her gun very often, but she always had one on her hip, and she looked pretty cool. And uh, after the war was over, she got a lot of awards, and I believe she went back to Ohio to finish out her days. And uh, she, yeah, she's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Yeah. She just ended up doing something that, like, literally was not even on the radar for her life whatsoever. And then, like, shit happened, and she was like, oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? (laughs) Um, So, oh, yeah, that's that's the other thing she did. So afterwards, she went to Madison, um, which I believe is in... What state are you in, Madison? Did I not write that down? Of course I didn't. Uh, so she she died of illness in 1898, um, but she died in the Madison home, which originally was a um, like religious home for men. <laughs> what is it? I don't even remember what it's called. Uh, but they turned it into a women's home for women who lost their husbands or fathers, the man of the house during the Civil War. So that they would have a place to go. And so she went there to actually help and nurse, be a nurse there and help with people. And then she grew ill and she died there. And that's where she haunts to this day. <laughs> but as a good person, she's a good ghost. And she actually talks to people and she wants to get her story out there. Apparently. Ooh. She doesn't spy. She just tells people stuff. Maybe she is spying. She's telling you stuff just to get information. <laughs> she's like she's, pre- she's prepping the the other undead for like to I don't know, you know, come out and like take over and you're like, "Oh, I got to collect all this information." And I'm glad she got to see slavery be abolished. Because yeah. I think that was reward enough for her with her life and everything she did. And she went on to still teach people. Um, it wasn't clear if it was Native kids still or if it was um, African kids. But she was teaching people of color. And she wanted to make sure they were getting the same education still after the war. Cool. I want to be her. Need more... Needed, we needed more people like that then and need more people like that now. Yeah, people willing to do whatever it takes, like, to Just do the, the right, right thing. To, to the, yeah. Yeah. My grandpa was born in 1898, the year that she died. Oh. He, yeah, he's, he was like 63 when my mom was born. So, my yeah, my mom was born in 57. My family all had babies really early. <laughs> yeah, he had, like, that was, like, his second marriage. Mm-hmm. So he had kids before that, but they they died in, like, different... Like, my... His first, his first wife and his daughter died in a car accident where a semi-truck went across the road and hit them. And then the son died in a, mo- on a motorcycle ac- accident. So, like, he just... That family was gone, and then he had a new one when he was much older... Um, and then, but yeah, like on my grandma's side, like, I mean, by the time she had my, my mom, she already had like five or six other kids. And then like all the, all the cousins, like when I was like 19, they're like, when are you going to start having babies? And I was like, I already told you, I don't, I don't even want to have kids. Like what? (laughs) That's what I said too. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh gosh. I hate that question for people. It's just so unnecessary and rude. Yeah. We it's have diff- people on this planet. Yeah. It's just not... It's different if you're, like, friends with the person and you know that they want kids. And you're already discussing it. Like, hey, what's your plan? Or, like, you're mutually, like, in the same place in life and both of you have already discussed that you want that. Yeah. And then discussing the plan and actually listening to the other person. But to just ask someone when they're going to have kids or get married or. Yeah. Making weird. the assumption of that a person is is ascribing to the status quo. And, you know, it's it's not nice. It is not nice. 
be nice guys yeah be nice leave uh, space for people to be different than you <laughs> I, yeah like i just made that video today because i woke up to i kid you not over 15 messages from people asking me how i am and i said that answer is going to be bad for a while now <laughs> like yeah i don't like that question because i feel like i either have to lie and just have a canned response or i tell the truth and it's exhausting and I mean, I guess there's a third option where I just say Nunya. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then I come I, across I, as rude. <laughs> I don't like that. So there, like, if you asked me how I was doing, I would just answer it. And I wouldn't have, like, the stress of do I need to answer honestly or not? Like, I'm not going to feel bad if I'm having a bad body day or whatever. Like, you, you understand that. But a lot of people will ask it. And I feel like they think my health issues are going to go away. And that's the answer that they're looking for. And that's like, it's really, um, it's really frustrating. And I, I literally get the question and I'm just like, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, and I agree with that. So I had somebody else ask me that after I posted the video and I thought they were making a joke because I posted the video asking how I am. And it's one of the only people I would be okay with asking me that question. Like you, this person, and probably like two other people, <laughs> I'd be yeah. okay with asking me that right now. But I thought he was making a joke. And I actually laughed when he sent it to me because I thought that he was joking. <laughs> but he's like, no, I didn't see that video. I really just wanted, I hadn't caught, been able to catch yeah. up with you for a couple of weeks. And I, I know that you always like feel safe to vent to me. And I'm like, okay, like I will, but... <laughs> Yeah, I thought it. So then I sent him the video, and he's like, "Oh my gosh, I feel so bad. I wouldn't have asked that if I saw your video." Yeah, there's. I mean, it's it's like, what do you you know if if somebody really wants an answer, you know, there there are ways to convey interest and concern without asking a really open ended question. Be like, "Hey, I wanted to check in with you and just kind of see how things were," and and like allow a person to know it your intentions are mm -hmm. and I think that that's part of the problem with such an open-ended question like that is you don't know what the other person's intentions are are they looking for a positive answer do they want like me to be like I am amazingly better today you know or is it you know and it that's could. mainly it's also an opening for them to ask you for something because that's true or they want you to ask them how they are so they can tell you something I don't just, ever do that. Just tell me the thing. You don't have to ask me <laughs> oh how I'm God. doing. <laughs> There's this person that I, I play video games with sometimes, and so we text, and he, he will text me um, these statements that are he's trying to force me to ask him, so he won't tell me. So he'll be like, I'm really upset right now, and he won't say anything else. Well, I don't, I hate that. I feel like I'm being manipulated, so I won't mm -hmm. respond. And then he never says anything at all because he waited until like it's so obviously it wasn't that important you know but um yeah so if people do that i just like i don't respond like just tell me if you want to tell me just tell me what's going on don't like have an agenda that i need to like read into because i also am not the kind of person that's going to be like tell me you know so how, you know how are you do you know sometimes yeah. i'll say and you because i'm being polite but people that I am comfortable talking with, I actually trust that they're going to share with me. So mm -hmm. I, I only like kind of check in if I'm curious and it's literally like coming from a curiosity of, hey, I haven't heard about this particular thing. So I'm going to ask about that. Or someone that talks to you a lot and then all of a sudden they've been quiet for like a day and you're like, what's going on? I know you've done that yeah. with me and that yeah. felt good. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, the pattern changed. I need to check in. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm glad you see the patterns because my life is very patternful. <laughs> I do the same things every day. And usually I communicate with the few people that I want to communicate with. But it is it is exhausting. Even if I don't respond to the continued comments and messages that are just like asking or like, I hope you're doing better. And it's like, I'm not. Thanks. I'm sorry. Your hope is crushed <laughs> yeah that it's such a like it feels so crappy like 
I honestly, when I got sick, people just disappeared and I didn't have anyone checking. I think I would have liked an annoying question over the silence. But um, later when I started to connect with people who started, I, I started being like, okay, this is, you know, and I literally, they would respond in a way that told me that they didn't get the answer they wanted. So that I learned to start anticipating this, this uh, dynamic that's like really stressful and you know and I'm I'm a very honest person so sometimes I just don't respond now like if I know that it's gonna be like that I just I'll talk about something else completely I just act like they said hello and don't even acknowledge the question and they pro- they usually will just skip right past it because they weren't really asking that question to ask right. it right they were wanting the connection and that's how they like we're taught at such such a young age to say these weird ra- things that we're just supposed to socially say to people. And I and know then, we've talked about and it not before. Mean it. Yeah. Like, there's so many social scripts that are not they say one thing but it's not actually what people mean and like it's really it doesn't it doesn't work for me. I mean what I say. <laughs> no. And it's these things like and it's also region based too I found that there's new ones in the Midwest from on the west coast it is weird <laughs> <laughs> like what there's um gosh there's different ways that they say sorry that they don't really mean like if you're going past somebody like in a grocery store and they're like trying to get past you it's like a oh let me just scooch on past you here like you don't need to say anything just go around me <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> What's the other one? It's really awkward, and I'm like, okay, you're not even like next to me. You're just like, I'll have my cart here, and they're just going around me, and yeah. I'm like, we don't need this conversation, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh gosh, I'm trying to think of some other ones that are like really passive aggressive, but there's a lot of the like sweetie and honey thing here that I don't like because it's always condescending how they say it. Yeah. <sighs> it's never the like intona- a- intonation and there's, it doesn't, I don't even know how to explain like, cause I've had people say it to me where it didn't feel condescending. Um, but like, and you know that they say that to everybody and it mm-hmm. doesn't, it, yeah. But there's definitely like, yeah. yeah. I don't like nicknames and pet names in general. Like, I'm very much like, I have a name, so don't... Like, when people are like, call me Babe or, like, Honey or something, and I'm like, that I don't answer to those. Like, <laughs> I, I might answer to, like, Shithead or Brat, but I'm not going to answer to, like, Sugar or, you know... Yo, bitch, not, get over here. Yeah. Did you ever see this video... Like, um, it's like, I'll, I'll send, send it to you later, but if it doesn't sound familiar, but like, they're like, see, and they're like, honey, bunny, honey, bunny, honey, bunny, like that. I don't like, think so. So every time he says honey or bunny is like nicknames, my brain just goes right to that video. I'll, I'll find it and send it to you. It's, I it's used weird. to call my ex husband that's still friends with me a peanut butter jellyfish sandwich. I have a friend that calls me pineapple head. See, that's, and, that's endearing. And, yeah. And I, I actually really like it. Like I did, I like signed out on one of my, my RV things where I was like pineapple head out just to be a smart ass. But like, um, that's the only nickname I've ever liked. And it ends up, there's a song called that. I didn't by, know um, that. By Crowded House. It's not very good. <laughs> But it's endearing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I asked my friend, I was like, did you know there's a song called Pineapple Head? Like, Pineapple Head? And he's like, no. <laughs> so I'm like, Just, there you go. My family has a nickname for me that I kind of made myself when I was like three. I don't remember making this, but I couldn't say my name when I was younger because no kid can. And so I'd call myself, (laughs) ta-da. And so they always just call me (laughs) Tada. That's funny. My, um, I, I used to stutter on my name, which was my name I had before. 
and it had caca so in it so that everybody just was calling me like caca no like, <laughs> <laughs> and then my sister couldn't say it either and she called me ai and that turned into like both my siblings called me ai growing up um Okay, yeah, that's okay. a little cuter. Not not yeah. caca. caca. I yeah. used to call my sister Jessica Titty Caca. <laughs> <laughs> she always had bigger boobs than me. And I don't think she does anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so now she can call me something ta titty something. I give you permission, Jessica. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Uh, all right. Anything else you want to bring up on this shindig hoot nanny? Oh, we should do a weird news. Weird news. Let's see. Should we do a Florida man news? Tell, tell me what you Google, because I want to see if I get the same results that you do. I just look up weird news. <laughs> it's usually like one of my one of my top stories, here, or top things here. Um... Are you going to click on, like, NPR? Or? That one I already did, so it's not updating very frequently, because we did that giraffe one. Because is that the one you see? Um, I actually don't... Well, hold on. I didn't click on the NPR. It just shows, like... Yeah, there's, like, giraffe, monster hunters, or... Condu- yeah, these are stuff that we discussed. Yeah. There's not enough weird news in the world. I'm going to look up Florida Man News. Florida Man News... Oh, gosh. All right, let's see. <laughs> oh, goodness. There's a lot of mug shots here. There's a guy that had a bull riding shotgun in his car. <laughs> in Nebraska. Oh, Nebraska man. All right, a Florida man was sentenced to a few days behind bars after an incident involving a woman at Red Lobster Restaurant. James Stevens, 49, was arrested back in April on a charge of battery touch or strike, according to an arrest report. On April 28th, Sumter County deputies responded to the Red Lobster. I won't read the address for a possible sexual offense. This isn't a funny Florida man. They spoke with a victim, a 20-year-old woman, who told them she was sitting at a table with a friend when Stevens approached the table and said a phrase similar to, Nice, or good lord. What? Stevens (laughs) then went to the restroom, but returned later to the table. He asked for food and began rubbing the woman on her shoulder. He allegedly spoke to them about being crazy for... If someone ever calls you crazy, you say I'm crazy for friends, crazy for love, crazy for success, or crazy for sex. (laughs) That's what you respond when someone calls you crazy, by the way, guys. Take it from Florida, man. Gosh, I can just imagine this guy coming up to my table and saying all this. (laughs) I would die laughing. He then leaned to the woman and giving her an unsolicited hug around her shoulders, the report says. She said he then rubbed her back and began to walk away, but not without telling her, have a nice night, baby girl. Baby girl is like the worst. It's only okay on um, criminal minds. (laughs) That's the only okay baby girl. Right. Because it's consenting. Mm Mm-hmm. The woman told law enforcement the encounter made her feel uncomfortable and she wished to press charges. Stevens became defensive and refused to provide a clear answer when asked about the incident. He was then arrested and booked into jail. Last week, he was sentenced to 10 days in jail after entering an adjudication guilty plea to the battery touch or strike charge. Something tells me that adjudication is not going to stick because he's going to do it again. Okay, I just try to think of like how many times I've had somebody kind of touch me in that way that I never thought about filing charges. I just went, well, that's uncomfortable. And then they went away and I was like, Phew. you know, right. I'm like, I could have gave them jail time. Wow. I just, I just recorded a podcast about um, men being violence from men being rejected because of that video that was coming up of the woman being hit in the face with a brick. Did you see that? It happened yesterday. Mm. Um, 
so a woman a guy came up to her asked her for her number and she said no he picked up a brick and she said to the guys like there was guys behind her and she said to them like are you gonna do something and they were like "Mm -hmm." and the guy smacked her in the face with a brick like her face is super swollen and the guys did nothing i'm not sure it looked like it probably did well, those guys are just as much a part of the problem because they didn't say anything. <laughs> Rude. Okay, this is an updated article, so we'll see how much we understand of it. Um, Dr. Joseph Dettiri, commonly known as Dr. Deep Sea. <laughs> <laughs> Deep Sea? Uh, (laughs) spent the weekend relaxing and enjoying the simple things after resurfacing from his record-breaking underwater journey. Uh, On June 9th, per the Associated Press, Dituri resurfaced from his stay in Jules Undersea Lodge after spending 100 straight days underwater without uh, depressurization as Guinness World Records previously announced. Dituri actually broke the record weeks ago with his 74th day underwater. Okay, so 74 was breaking it, but he went to 100. The doc, Dr. Deep Sea. <laughs> uh, the longest time spent living in an underwater wa- fixed habitat is 74 days and was achieved by Joseph Dituri. Was that him? He who entered Jules Undersea Lodge, a steel and glass facility anchored at a depth of 9.14 meters, 30 feet, just off the coast of Key Largo. Did it say what he ate? I'm just curious what he ate. I know, right? (laughs) Um, Just off the coast of Key Largo. Okay, I said that. On March 1st, 2023, as verified on the 13th of May, 2023, Guinness World Records said last month. Uh, Joseph Tatiri has set a new record for the longest time living spent underwater. You've already said that, Florida. <laughs> um, so let's let me see if it says what he ate anywhere. Nope, nope. Tatiri is currently conducting experiments to monitor how the human body responds to extreme pressure over long periods of time, and is also still teaching classes during his time underwater. <laughs> so his internet. Yeah, he has internet 30 miles, wow. or 30 feet, not miles, under the water. <laughs> and in, in an Instagram post celebrating the achievement, Dituri said that he's humbled to have broken the world record, but th- it sounds like he broke the record from himself, though. Yeah, <laughs> it does. And he's just making it harder for anybody else that decides to do the same thing. Yeah. But, uh, but, but it sounds like he- he's doing it for, like, scientific reasons as well, so it's... Yeah. Dituri dubbed his mission, which was organized by the Marine Resources Development Foundation, Neptune 100, in reference to the number of days he's staying underwater. He, so this was written before, he will resurface on June 9th. Um, the things that I miss the most about being on the surface is literally the sun. <laughs> The sun has been a major factor in my life. I usually go to the gym at 5 a.m. and then I come back and back out and watch the sunrise. Another person who is more active than us. (laughs) Um, That wasn't a funny one either. Come on, Florida men. I'm just like, I want to know what he was, like, I don't know how big the thing was he was in. I'm guessing it wasn't that big, but I want to know, like, what. Yeah, because it had internet and. Did he have, like, a food replicator? (laughs) Here's a funny right? one. I got a funny one. <laughs> a Florida man was arrested after a bizarre three-day s- standoff there's at a, sea. There's a microwave in there. So what? Did he have like MREs? Fish and eggs. Fish and, and eggs. stuff. Weird. Hmm. Um, Florida man oh, would... He, oh, sorry. And you would do a daily scuba trip. Like, oh, so he, but he, he stayed to go under out. the water. Yeah. Hmm. You better not have surfaced during that time, Dr. Deep Sea. <laughs> um, so here's a funny one. A Florida man was arrested after a bizarre three-day standoff at sea with the U.S. Coast Guard for trying to cross the Atlantic in a human-powered hamster wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Florida. You brought us. And one it wasn't of one own. of the, like, it wasn't like those things you see, like, in New Zealand or whatever. It's like the big 
balls that people go into and then like go down the hills or whatever it was like actually like a hamster wheel type thing i don't see a picture yet but we'll see if one surfaces here <laughs> Riza Bulachi faces federal charges after he was found 70 miles off the Georgia coast with Hurricane Franklin taking aim at the eastern seaboard. The USS Coast Guard Cutter Valiant, that's a name, was in the region when they spotted Mr. Bulachi Baluchi and <laughs> intercepted him. When questioned during the 26th of August incident, Mr. Bellucci said he was heading for London. <laughs> How gonna, long would I'm that take? Run, I'm just gonna run over there. <laughs> How much he food got, did he bring? Did he? Bring and he food? got federal charges. Like, like he didn't like. They could have just sprayed him with a water bottle and been like, "Bad, don't do that again." But he actually got federal charges for that. Based on the condition of the vessel, which was afloat as a result of wiring and buoys, USGC officer determined Bellucci was conducting a manifestly unsafe voyage. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Bellucci, when allegedly threatened to kill himself with a 12-inch knife if anyone tried to arrest him and also claimed to have a bomb on board his craft. (laughs) (laughs) On August 28th, after days of trying to get Mr. Bellucci on board Coast Guard vessels, he admitted that he did not have a real bomb, (laughs) and a day later, officers were able to get him to disembark. (laughs) He's like... If I tell them I have a bomb, maybe I can, like, get to London. Because, <laughs> you know, London's like, sure, no problem, you know. Yeah, come on over in your hamster wheel. With your bomb. Your hamster bomb. <laughs> the suspect was brought ashore on what on the 1st of September at USGCG base in Miami Beach, Florida. It is reportedly not the first time Mr. Bellucci has tried an extreme voyage on this vessel. <laughs> Why did they take it away from him? <laughs> oh, there's a picture. Oh, it's weird. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Oh, it is weird. I mean, it looks kind of fun, though. Yeah, fun for a day. <laughs> yeah, like for an outing. Like yeah. a an outing or something. Court documents state that he has attempted voyages on similar vessels in 2014, 2016, and 2021. So he's doing it wrong. He needs to he needs to do a GoFundMe, make a big deal out of it, get some permits, mm-hmm. and then like make it a thing where he's like hamster wheel to London, and it becomes like legal because it's like a sports thing or something. I don't know. There's got there's got to be like a way to. Exactly. Legally do this, sir. Yeah. Join, uh, what did the last guy do? Uh, I was about to say a series of unfortunate events. <laughs> the record, world records. <laughs> Not, yeah. This probably is a series of unfortunate events, though. In 2021, he made national news when he tried a journey from Florida to New York, but washed ashore just 25 miles mm-hmm. later. <laughs> He, he faces char- charges of obstruction of a boarding and a violation of a captain of port order. The end. I wonder what his like background is that it's I because I, I like it, it just makes me think like somebody who gets an obsession but doesn't have the knowledge to make it happen kind of thing. So he's just trying to piece it together and just at least it's on top of the water instead of down by the Titanic. It's kind of like the flat earth guy, but, you know, we kept trying to prove the earth is flat by doing, like, rockets and stuff. Oh, my. Why don't you just take a ship around the world instead? <laughs> <laughs> just go to the edge. <laughs> just, yeah. If there is an I, edge. Okay. I so. saw a flat earther truck when I was in Arizona, like, with all the messaging on it and stuff. And I was just like, how? Whoa! Okay, flat earthers out there, 
if any of you want to come on and do a podcast with us, we would love to hear you, like actually hear you and why you believe the things you believe. Because I would love to talk to a real flat earther and I won't try to convince you it's round. I want you to try to convince us it's flat. Yeah. It even said NASA is a hoax on the door. And I was just like, <laughs> it's a very NASA, expensive hoax. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we talked about someone who worked for them. <laughs> and is the moon flat too? Right. It's just like a, it's, we're just facing it the right way that that's why we can see it. It's like, if you went down below, it's it'd be like, a, yeah, <laughs> here's the moon now. Is everything flat? Is the whole universe flat? Are we flat? Oh. That makes me think of that book um, <laughs> where everybody's in, um, is they're basically flat. And it's a philosophical book. Yeah. But I can't remember what it's called now. There's an yeah. episode of Adventure Time like that. Yeah. I feel like they took that from the book. That may, That would make sense. Yeah. Um, that was a very interesting episode. That one and the bird, the one where they turn into birds and worms. Yeah. That's like the weird. <laughs> There's like some of those episodes are just very like kind of artistic in the storytelling. Uh, mm -hmm. Bojack Horseman also had a couple episodes like that where they were very like they like the one where he goes down into the ocean. And he's under you know, under the water and there's no speaking and yet they managed to have an entire episode tell yes. all the stories, you know, it was just very I artistic the my, whole time. I think that's my favorite episode of that show. And I have not seen all of it, but I've definitely seen that episode. And I need to watch that show. Yeah, I had a friend who, she was like, you should watch it. I'm not sure if you'll like it, but I think you'll like it. And for her, it like blew her mind because she had like no real exposure to like addiction or whatever mm -hmm. um so it was like very eye-opening and then for me because I grew up around addicts I was like bored through half of it and angry through the other half oh, <laughs> and no. I was like it was it was very well done but I was also just like I get very tired of the topic because of my exposure to it and um but I, I ended up enjoying it. Like, there were other things in there. Like, there was an asexual character. That was, like, so exciting. You that know? is exciting. Like, I was just like, yay, representation. I don't know why <laughs> shows don't have more ace, like, either aromantic or asexual characters. Because they seem to think sex is so entertaining. But having that dynamic and people realizing how normal it is and how many people are actually... Like, being ace does not mean you never have sex. Right. It, it's I mean, just, it, for some people it does, but yeah. not, there's there's many. I mean, I, I enjoy sex, but I am, don't experience the type of attraction that mm -hmm. makes me select people based on that. You know, it's all, yeah, it's all here, you know, but like, yeah, do, like, do you consider yourself like sapiosexual? Um, demisexual is what I consider sapiosexual. I don't, I've never considered an actual like because that's like just being attracted to intelligence and that mm -hmm. seems a little bit like petty yeah um you know like it's not the same it's not like a drive you know like the way that um being demisexual or whatever where, where the only time you have sexual feelings is you know but i don't know you know the rules change on that stuff all the time so yeah um but i definitely am attracted to intelligence but I have never, like, it's the connection that feeds my sexuality for me. So I need that. And and then at that point, I'm very enthusiastic. But before I have a connection, it's like, I never, like, look at somebody and go, wow, I want to take their pants off without knowing them. It's the knowledge of the person that makes me think they deserve to have their pants taken off. And then I look at any big titty goth girl and I'm just like, I want to take her pants <laughs> off. <laughs> I wish sometimes that I got to experience attraction that way because I feel like I missed out on a lot of fun and a lot of feelings of like excitement. not having to have the feelings to get there and you could have yeah yeah because because I've never I've never really gotten to be in a relationship where my demisexual connection need was actually I I just was going through the motions thinking eventually I you know because I didn't know I was demi so I was like well maybe if I just do this enough I'll I'll learn. And then when I learned about demisexuality, I was like, oh shit, 
there's like there's a thing there's a reason and there's others you know. like me out there <laughs> yeah so and and it's i i feel like in theory it would be like a good thing if i could have that connection but it just never has really worked out for me but i know other people that have they're like and they're with demisexual people and they have like really amazing relationships so you know. someday yeah <laughs> we don't have the best luck with that though <laughs> no <laughs> I opted to be alone because it is easier and I uh and then when I decided maybe I shouldn't be alone it was not easier <laughs> no when you feel more alone in a relationship that's a problem <laughs> Big time. God, that's exactly... That was, like, the hardest part of it was, like, I was, like, I am bored because I feel so alone, but I feel shackled to the relationship, so I can't go do the things that would help me be entertained because, you know, I'm very monogamous and, like, um, very, like, loyal when I connect with somebody, you know? Like, I could be involved with somebody that's poly and that wouldn't be a problem as long as they tell me everything because I need to know everything well your safety um, too like that's yeah yeah I just it should be yeah but like um but like for me like once I've connected with somebody it's there's like no room for anybody else and yeah I feel that I think for me being poly I don't when I'm dating people right now not right now, obviously. <laughs> when I was dating people, I didn't... I wanted to date people who had a primary partner already. Because I didn't want to feel like I needed to meet all of their needs and they needed to meet all of mine. Because to me at the time, it felt exhausting to even yeah. think about them having to meet all of my needs, let alone me meeting all of theirs. So I'm yeah. like, I could be your fun date girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I could totally see that. Like, I... I don't have like a lot of like I don't see relationships I think the way that other people because I'm very I like a lot of alone time I like to do my own thing so to me like somebody meeting my needs is not you know I have friends I don't I don't know you know it's like yeah relationship is like one set of things but for me it's not all the things that a lot of other people expect it to be you know like to me in my relationship I would want that person to be my best friend so we go get in trouble together and have fun together and like body double and parallel play and do our own shit and then come back and share our shit and just somebody to look forward to, you know, and I don't know. How fast can I be there? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like I'm very independent and, mm -hmm. you know. You don't want to feel like you're being held. Like, I know we've talked about your past relationships even on here and you don't want to feel like you're holding yourself back in order to help the other person progress exactly and that yeah. makes a lot of sense and it's hard to stop yourself from doing that it's not even necessarily that the other person is making you do that but they're not being the same support to you that you're being to them which yeah because i i yeah. think like the most like idealistically in my mind when i think about like relationships it's something that would be good is that a relationship where both people benefit and grow as a result of it. They don't even have to grow in the same ways, but they both grow as people uh, because of the relationship. That is like, to me, the ideal. Like I, if I feel stagnant in a relationship, I want out. I don't want to stay. Like, what's the point? I can do, I can go do stuff on my own and not feel stagnant, you know? Yeah, definitely. I like my loan dates. I used to, when I was living in Denver, go to the movies once a week by myself, at least once a week. <laughs> and then the people that I was dating at the time or was friends with at the time uh, wanted to go see the same movies, so I'd go and see them like three times. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a movie pass, so I could go as much as I wanted. Yeah. And But I like going to the movies by myself because no one's looking at you, you're there alone and you can just have your quiet time and just mindlessly focus on something else maybe that's what like I don't like going to the movies and the reason why I don't like going to the movies is other people mm -hmm. like it, the talking the eating the smells and then the what did you think right at, you're not even out the fucking door and they're like and I'm like 
I haven't even finished processing the sensory experience of the bass, much mm-hmm. less the story or the cinematography or anything. I need time to process things. And like, don't ask me that right now. I get super annoyed. So I just stopped going to the movies because other that's such a normal thing. And I felt so like, like uncomfortable telling people don't do what's normal because it makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> I can't stand the, you know, I can't stand the food noises either. So I have to sit away from people. <laughs> so I usually don't pick my seat until right before the movie because I can pick, you can usually pick your seat now. And I'll yeah. see where everyone else is sitting and be like as far away from them as possible. <laughs> but a lot of times, because I kind of have the freedom of going in the middle of the day, I'm sometimes the only person in there. <laughs> yeah, day, I like Monday early afternoon is a good time. I also like the um, places that serve real food um, because you don't get the plastic wrapper sounds and stuff. Yes. And that, that does help. You get a lot of the smells, but I can get around the smells if I'm not getting the like <laughs> and stuff, you know, the people digging in there to get the popcorn or whatever. Yeah, um, I wish we could wear like headphones to the movies and you get the sound that way instead. <laughs> That would be super awesome, like, especially with my hearing loss, like, because I, my hearing loss is right in the middle, so it's all vocal range. Um, so sometimes, like, with the movies, if there's a lot of other stuff going on, I won't be able to hear the voices, even in the really nice theaters that have a hundred different speakers, and you're supposed to be able to hear the voices. Mm-hmm. All right, movie theaters, that's your challenge. You need to make movies where we can even bring our own headphones, and they connect Bluetooth. Let's do that. That'd be awesome. Like have the sound going outside too, but for us sensory humans, there's a lot of us out there. We would love to be able to listen just in our heads. <laughs> yeah, it could be like a you know like a once a week event or something that they have a couple showings and you know kind of like the the mommy days where it's where people can bring their kids or yeah whatever and the lights are up and it's quieter. Yeah. I used to take, because it was a dollar to go to those when Logan was little, so I would take him, and then the kids could all play in the front while the moms watched the movie. That's awesome. I never went to any of those, but I thought it was a good idea. I used to take my son to the, there was a, like, uh, independent movie theater in downtown San Jose, and they would have, like, uh, midnight showings of things, and it would be very, very nerdy. Um, Like, they do quote-alongs and things like that, Mm -hmm. and so I used to take my son to those when he was, like between eight and 11 or so and that was always fun like like once a month that's fun i know they were doing some like anime ones in denver like randomly and those seemed fun i never got to go to any of them but they were free we saw the one of the things we saw was like the original animated transformers movie that was really cool and then like around halloween it was uh, simpsons like um What's that called? Their series, their their Halloween stuff. Yeah, I don't yeah. remember what it's called, but yeah, yeah, that's, that's fun. I wouldn't even think of that, like being what they would show at Halloween. That that is fun, and it's not what what's everywhere else. So yeah, cool. Bring back more things like that, guys. Right. Rah. What? All right. I think we'll wrap this one up because I have to pee. <laughs> doing the potty dance in my seat Uh, so thank you for listening to us uh, blabber on about ourselves as well as listen to an awesome story about a spy that didn't shag me Uh, (laughs) thank you thank you for joining us in the crow's nest Uh, this has been Tyler and Lee bye (laughs) bye (laughs) we're so awkward at this and if you, I will post both of our Patreons in the description, as well as the email to be able to write in um, awesome stories, whether for my other segment about paranormal things and weird things, or this one about amazing women in your life or ones in history that you think we should talk about that aren't talked about enough. Um, and yeah, this has been Frightening Frauen. Crows out. <laughs> <laughs>